Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 27, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, COINTELPRO is alive today in the USA, and they are hell-bent on starting a government-brewed race war to establish order out of chaos. Then, the establishment wants to sabotage Brexit by punishing the UK back into submission. Meanwhile, the United Nations is gaining control over the U.S.-Mexico border. Plus, anti-globalist protesters fight back in California as six militant leftists were stabbed when they attacked members of the Traditionalist Worker Party in Sacramento. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Everyone is talking about the international global crisis that is presented by Brexit. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about a crisis that not too many people are talking about, and that is the constitutional crisis represented by today's Supreme Court decision on Texas's abortion law. Now, we had a uh, op-ed on Slate uh, via the Drudge Report, and this particular law professor is talking about what many people term a living constitution. Let me lay this out for you, and then we'll review what the Supreme Court decision does and why a living constitution is so dangerous. He says, I see absolutely no value to a judge spending decades, years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, or even seconds, no seconds, studying the constitution, the history of its enactment, its amendments, its implementation across the centuries. He says, it means that the original Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the post-Civil War amendments do not speak to us today. Why? Because no matter how smart these guys were, these dead white men living in the 18th century, they don't know about our culture, our technology, things in the 21st century. The problem is human nature doesn't change. Human nature has stayed the same throughout all of history. The Constitution was written to control human nature, not to control technologies. It is bigger than the technologies that we have. It's about principles. It's about the rule of law. Because what he goes on to say is the Supreme Court should treat the Constitution like it's authorizing the court to create, create a common law of constitutional law based on current concerns, not on what those 18th century guys are worrying about. Understand this. What they are doing is creating a body of law, a body of law that is independent, not accountable to the written law. You see, we have a written law because we didn't want to let political appointees or a king or anyone else dictate to us what our laws would be without any kind of representation. We fought a war because we didn't want taxation without representation, yet we have not only taxation, but legislation without representation. This is what's so dangerous about this. It is a in-your-face dictatorship by the judges, by our executive branch, by Obama, that is what's happening now. We no longer have a rule of law. Now, these judges swear to uphold the Constitution, don't they? But they shouldn't spend any time, not even a second, not hours, minutes, or even seconds, studying what they swear to uphold. Because they are under the Constitution. They are merely temporary stewards of the Constitution. These are principles. We have a process for amending it. We have a process for writing laws. But they don't care about our elected legislature. We have people who want to rule by executive order, by fiat, and that's what these judges are doing today. You see, we also have a secret court, a FISA court, and they are also creating a body of law that they say has the same effect as the Constitution, and yet we're not even allowed to see what that secretive body of law is. That's what should concern us. We have a dictatorship, we have a secret dictatorship, except now they're publicly saying, we want a living Constitution, one that actually has absolutely nothing to do with that written piece of paper that we all swear allegiance to. Now, this is what happened, and I pointed this out earlier today on the fourth hour of the radio show. We had five justices. We had a justice that was appointed by Ronald Reagan joining with the Clinton justices, joining with the Obama justices to support abortion, not to act as impartial referees of a law that is created by someone else, because we had a division of powers. These are principles, eternal principles based upon human nature and the understanding that power corrupts. 
Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and power wants to concentrate itself in Washington. That's why we have the Constitution that divides power. But look at what they did. This is a situation where these justices came in, and as Alito, Justice Alito, pointed out in his dissent, and as the Wall Street Journal pointed out, he was visibly disturbed, visibly angry, rocking back and forth in his seat as he listened to this other decision. What they said in the decision was they basically laid out the number of clinics had been cut in half by these rules. They said, look at how far people have to go to get an abortion, for example. So it was a pragmatic examination of the consequences of this law. It had absolutely nothing to do with the law itself. As a matter of fact, what this decision did was to shut down the Supreme Court's own decisions and the principle of law that has long been held that you don't get a do-over. As Justice Alita pointed out, they had already adjudicated this in a court, they had lost, they had failed to appeal, and now they came back with exactly the same case, the same law, and took it to the Supreme Court. He said it should never have been heard. Furthermore, he said they violated a second fundamental principle of law, and that is severability. It was made abundantly clear throughout the Texas law that all of these different regulations that were put on. Some of them said that you had to have someone who was admitted to a nearby hospital to be present there as part of the uh, abortion clinic. You could strike down something like that, but they even struck down fire regulations. And he said all of these regulations were independent of each other, but they took out everything. And it was made clear in the law that they were all severable. In other words, these were independent uh, legislation uh, issues, some of them having to do with safety. And so when you look at this and you say, well, all they did was look at the current society and say, well, we would like to have abortion easily available. And we don't really care what the principles of the Constitution are. We don't care what historically the principles of law have been. So we're just going to fine for that. And how does this work itself out in other ways? I would say to many of the people who are looking at this, look at the story from The Intercept. When they talk about a right to privacy for abortion, think about this right to privacy. We've got the FBI and the police are knocking on activists' doors ahead of the Republican National Convention to intimidate people. And you got the head of the NAACP saying the purpose of these door knocks is simple, to intimidate the target and others in efforts to discourage people from engaging in lawful First Amendment activities. Now, we just talked to Roger Stone at the end of last week. He talked about how they have shrunk the uh, the area that they had as a security area from a four mile radius down to a one mile radius. They want to contain demonstrators in a very small area, essentially, well, literally box them in and have them all together, people who are on different sides of the issue, trying to create conflict, but also to stifle and to suppress our First Amendment rights, to intimidate people. Where is the right to privacy when we go to the airport? Where is the right to privacy from the surveillance state? Nowhere. The Supreme Court is no friend to the right to privacy. And yet, they will strike down all of these laws and give a do-over to these people, violating all the rules, procedures, and the Constitution in order to further their agenda. This is not judicial activism. This is simply a dictatorship. Simply a dictatorship. And we can see that when we look at the other aspects where this is coming out. Now, when we look at what's going on with Brexit and the crisis that's there, I would say that Fundamentally, what we're seeing now is stage two. It looked like they could not win the election, so now the stage two is to break it. They want to try to create a crisis. It was a project fear to try to persuade people not to get out of the European Union. Now that, that vote has been taken and they could not shut that down, they are trying to do everything they can to make all of the dire predictions of economic, uh, economic consequences come true. And we're going to take a look at that. But first of all, look at, again, they want a do-over. And we see this from the younger voters complaining, the millennials complaining about the baby boomer generation saying, we're the ones who are going to have to live with this. We want to be in the European Union, but you're the ones who wanted to get out. Now, just understand, if we go back and look at the history, there was also a referendum back in 1975. Two thirds of the voters then opted to stay in the EU. Four years later, it had flipped the other way around. Most of them wanted to leave. And these are the people, the baby boomers, who have been living under this EU for 40 years. See, this is not about racism, as I like to say. It's not even about economic issues. It is fundamentally about sovereignty. It is about a loss of control. Whether or not you're going to be a serf to someone else, someone who is going to write the laws for you, just as we see with the Supreme Court, just as we see with President Obama, 
unelected people at a distant location who have their own agenda, and they're not going to allow you to have elected representatives who are going to write the laws. That's what's been going on in Europe for a very long time. It's what we see happening here in spades. For example, there's an article from the Daily Mail, the bonfire of the EU laws from crooked cucumbers to powerful vacuum cleaners, the crazy Brussels regulations we can now get rid of. And of course, they're talking about things like banning bananas that are too curvy. Uh, cucumbers that are crooked and not straight, banning incandescent light bulbs. Oh, we've seen that here, haven't we? Banning vacuum cleaners that are too powerful. And it wasn't just vacuum cleaners. They had a whole list of appliances they were going to get rid of. Even drinking water, they said, does not prevent dehydration. This was a ruling by the European Commission in 2011. See, no matter how ridiculous the ruling, they're going to continue to go with it. And yet today, we see, even after the election. We see, still see David Cameron doubling down, saying this is about xenophobia, it's about racism, and it's not. It is about sovereignty. David Cameron, when they were having the debates, said don't vote for Brexit based on the flyers coming out from UKIP. He said there's three issues there. He said they're telling you it's 350 million pounds a week going net to Brussels. No, it's not that much. It's a different number. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It can be any number, and Brussels can change it at will. He said, There's, they're telling you that Turkey is going to come in. Don't worry, that won't happen for uh, until after I'm out of office. And then he says, and they're telling you there's a European army. Okay. Uh, we have an article what we're going to talk about here in just a moment. But understand that what they're concerned about is not just Britain leaving, but a whole slew of nations leaving. 40% of Swedes, Poles, and Belgians are in the same vote. And we've also got Finland, Hungary, Portugal, Slovakia, France, Holland, Italy, Austria, Many of those say they would like to have a vote as well, and people are joking about it. If the polls leave, will it be a pole vault, uh, or will we have uh, Portugal leaving, and it'll be a departure? Uh, it'll leave, Austria, check out, you know, those are jokes that are coming out. What are they doing to fight this? Well, it's out of the election stage right now, so what they are doing is they're basically holding a gun to people's heads with the stock markets, manipulating these markets. We've seen HSBC get caught two times, at least, okay, convicted twice, of money laundering for drug cartels and for terrorists getting away with it. We've seen all these big banks now who are creating crisis around Brexit. These are the banks that manipulated the LIBOR exchange, the London Interbank Rate Exchange that is the basis of all variable rate mortgages. We've seen them manipulate currencies. We've seen them manipulate commodities, stock exchanges. Every kind of market has been manipulated by these bankers. And now what they're saying is, this is HSBC coming out saying, well, we're going to take 70,000 jobs out of London. We're already planning to move 1,000 workers from London to Paris, and it's going to start next week. They haven't even started the process of leaving, but immediately they're pulling this out because they want to make it as financially painful as possible, trying to get people to reverse themselves. They saw this happen in 1975. They saw people change their mind. They've already got people saying, well, we've got to have a do-over. They're going to try to make it as difficult as possible. They are selling off the pound. They, we're seeing uh, S&P downgrading the uh, entire country, downgrading all the UK. How long did it take them to downgrade these bankers and these people who were playing games with mortgages in the financial crisis? I mean, watch the movie, uh, Big Short. It is the Wall Street financial equivalent of 13 hours. You're watching this, and everybody can see there's absolutely, it's a Ponzi scheme. There's absolutely no basis for these mortgages, for Lehman Brothers, for these other uh, companies. They're expecting Standard & Poor's and Fitch and all these other uh, rating agencies to downgrade them, and they don't do it. And these guys are making bets based on the bankruptcy of this mortgage market. And yet Standard & Poor's refuses to downgrade, the, and these guys went bankrupt. Watch the movie, Big Short, you can see that. And yet in one day, in one day, you see Standard & Poor's downgrade the entire nation of Great Britain by two notches, from AAA to AA. Uh, Fitch, meanwhile, moved its rating from AA plus to AA. They dropped them down one notch. This is the way they're trying to punish people. And it's not just that. They're talking about how English will not be the official European Union language, will not be one of the languages. Of course, they have 24 official languages. It is a veritable Tower of Babel. They self-consciously reference, and we've talked about the artwork at uh, Brussels and the European Union, how they reference the Tower of Babel for a world government as well. But uh, they're going to uh, remove English. Well, you know, the 
true uh, nature of English is it is the lingua franca of the 21st century, and it is has that status uh, as a de facto status, not because somebody pronounced it as being an important thing. They're trying to create a European superstate. They're going to do it out of fear. Project Fear is not over with the election. Project Fear is alive and well. They're trying to go from Brexit to break it, and we can see where they are putting their power here. We see foreign ministers of France and Germany have revealed a blueprint to effectively do away with individual member states. It has always been about political union. It has not been about even the economics. They begin with a common trade group, and then they use that to push people into a uh, political sovereignty that is distant from them. And they're saying that they're putting this out as an ultimatum. Under the radical proposals, EU countries will lose the right to have their own army, their own criminal law, their own taxation system, the central bank, with all those powers being transferred to Brussels. And again, remember, it was David Cameron who said, none of that exists. Oh, but it does. And we have pointed that out multiple times. It was well known to the people who voted uh, who were baby boomers. They knew where this was coming from. They knew the plan of this. And now we see this being uh, surfacing in the uh, Polish media. They are releasing the details of this. They say the only way to make Europe more than the sum of a member state diplomacies is to make it into a real state. And this is something that even CNN is promoting with a former U.S. ambassador, Christopher Hill. This is on yesterday's Sunday show. Multi-level governance, he said, may be just about satisfactory for managing mountains of butter, but it is barely suitable for making decisions about guns. Yes, it is about world government. It is about creating a European superstate. It is about creating a North American superstate, a North American union, and consolidating these different groups into a world government. Now you can see it. Now they brag about it, just as they brag about turning our Constitution into a dictatorship, a living document. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Leanne McAdoo, joined by Rob Dew in studio. Now we're going to be taking an in-depth look at a violent rally that took place this weekend in Sacramento. It was kind of a face-off between two extremist groups. Uh, things got pretty violent there. They were each calling each other fascists, uh, but both groups were trying to shut down the opinion of the other with violent means, by any means necessary. Well, definitely you could say that about the one group. They're actually called by any means necessary, and they went there with the sole intent of shutting down the group, the Traditionalist Worker Party, uh, who basically you could say they're a, 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 a white Aryan supremacy organization. And they were going to have a, uh, they pro applied for permits, and they were going to have an event on the ca uh, steps of the Capitol in Sacramento. And this group, by any means necessary, showed up with sticks, apparently with knives too, because people mm -hmm. got stabbed, and a face-off occurred. And they even said one of their uh, spokespeople actually got up and said in front of the cameras, we're going to take violent Militant, well, militant direct action, she right. said, the, to quote her. And here you can see a young lady, it looks like she's going to get clocked in the head and she's drug off after uh, a guy just takes a whack at her. Totally ridiculous. And we're not even going to have a war of words at all. We're just going to start beating people up and causing this. Yeah. And this is something that the FBI, I think, thrives in, taking two groups opposing each other and putting them together. And who knows how they're uh, promoted like this. But let's go back to this... Um, this one militant, Yvette Fokara, she was interviewed by ABC News, and she uses the words militant direct action several times in the speech. Here's that clip. BAMS, our method is to build a mass militant, integrated, anti-racist and immigrant rights movement. The Nazis and the fascists are dangerous. They need to be stopped and shut down by any means necessary. BAM is building and leading a movement that's committed to building militant, integrated, direct action to shut them down by any means necessary. But that's what it takes. That's what building a mass militant movement takes. So Leanne, not only is she advocating direct militant action, um, She's also a middle school teacher. She teaches at King, not Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School in Berkeley. She's the humanities teacher for the seventh grade. Wow. So these are the people, and she this took is, it off her Facebook This is educating your children. Right. This is why they come out of school and you're thinking, who are these people? Where it's did they learn this stuff? Well, they, this is their teacher right here. A bandage on her head, obviously got into a scuffle, advocating more violent action against people that they deem, they say, this is hate speech, we're going to stop it. It doesn't matter, you know, there's no there's no looking at it arbitrarily. It's just, this is hate speech, we're going to attack it. Pretty soon it's going to be, if you don't believe the earth is warming because of man, 
well, that's hate speech and we have to attack you. Right. Anything they could say is hate speech and then they can go ahead and attack it because all they've done is go, hey, it's hate speech, so we're gonna go after it. And the, the irony here is that we are constantly making the argument that the First Amendment doesn't protect violent hate speech and yet that's what they're coming to do is by any means necessary, be violent, be militant. And it's okay because they're in the right. Right. Because they follow Bernie Sanders. And because they don't like Trump. It's like anything they could think of, it's, oh, this is bad, racist. we say it's bad, we say it's racist, so now we get to attack it. Well, and their whole platform is like, it's racist if you don't allow completely open borders, you don't accept the fact that immigrants are here illegally, and they want us to live up to the American ideal, the pro professed ideals of freedom uh, and equality for all the people that are coming here illegally. It's, and, then, and that's insane. Right. Deporting people is breaking up families. But hey, guess what? If I don't pay my income tax, I go to jail. That's breaking up the family. That's the government doing the same thing, but it's okay because I need to pay my income taxes in order to support this ridiculous socialist well, utopia that they and want. And speaking of paying taxes, they must have some sort of a 501c3 set up because you can make tax deductible donations to their organization. Right, and this lady, Yvette Fokura, she actually had on her Facebook page that she used to work, or she works at this school, and you can find it in their directory. She's listed in their directory as a teacher. So this is a middle school teacher basically advocating violence. Now let's look at the other side. You have uh, this traditionalist party, which was, it seemed to be led by this man named Matthew Heimbeck. This is a guy who graduated from school in 2013 with a history degree from uh, Townsend WSU, okay? Basically formed a, a, a white supremacist group there. He's traveling around, he, he kind of marries into the, the legions and tours Eastern Europe and, and has all these events. Now, he seems to be coming really prominent in just a few short years. Right. Uh, the Washington Post has an article about him, Vice has done a profile on him. This guy's getting all the free press he can ask for. And, you know, I, I was watching a video by, by a guy, his name's Spiro, I believe, with Newsbud, and he came out and started talking about how FBI inform, how the FBI works to get these groups to fight each other. Right. The FBI has a history of having uh, informants in the Black Panthers, in the Ku Klux Klan, in other white supremacist groups. They like to ki insert people into these groups as leaders, give them funding, give them money so they don't have to go out and actually work for a living. They can just kind of act as the de facto leader for these groups in order to gear them into areas where you would be creating violence because right. the FBI thrives on stuff like this. The government thrives on stuff like this. They want to see groups fighting each other. Now, I'm not saying Matthew Heimbeck is being paid by the FBI or it is an informant. I'm just saying the FBI does have a history of doing right. this. And you can look at it in, in any, they looked at, they were looking at Mateen, Omar Mateen. And in fact, they tried to get him into uh, entrap him before he even committed that, uh, that attack at the uh, gay nightclub in right. Orlando. Yes, and we can look, COINTELPRO goes back six, to the 60s and 70s, of course. Um, Paul Wolf documents it in COINTELPRO, The Untold American Story, and it documents the role that the FBI played in the Ku Klux Klan uh, there, and he writes, however, Bureau Intelligence assets were neither neutral observers nor objective invest in investigators, but have been active participants in beatings, bombings, and murders that claim the lives of some 50 civil rights activists. So just like you're saying that, they weren't there to just be silent observers or to maybe make some suggestions of agent provocateurs. Groups. They yes, these groups into engaging conflict. in the violence and then getting propped up as leaders and public spokespersons for these groups. Right, and before we get away from that, Richard Okoy, the only Asian American who held a formal leadership position in the Black Panther Party, was exposed as an FBI informant after an FOIA request. So, you know, it, it could be on both sides. They could be funding both sides. People don't realize this, that they're part of these groups and they may think they're doing it for the best intentions, but the leadership of your groups may be compromised. It may be steering you into places where you don't wanna go. And all this is leading up to what's gonna happen this summer. You got the DNC and the RNC right. in Cleveland and in Philadelphia. These are kind of North, uh, North American, United States Rust Belt cities, cities that don't have good economies, cities that are ripe for the type of rioting that could occur. And you've got, by any means necessary, saying they're gonna make that happen. And a lot of their rhetoric in there is geared only towards Donald Trump. Donald Trump hasn't been in this race but less than a year now, just over a year 
He's been right. running for president. He, he didn't create done all the everything. problems. Exactly. Okay? He's not the cause of all the racism in the world and all the bigotry and all the open borders. You know, and but it's just like this this is the only reason for their right. existence now is to stop Donald Trump. And, and talk it makes about you wonder the leaders. Who's funding these yeah, groups. being the leaders being behind the groups, and that's it. It's like channel all of your energy, all of your anger, all of your hatred, all of our resources. Right. We're gonna go and attack Donald Trump at these protests, these rallies. Meanwhile, you know, all these Bernie supporters, they should have been going after Hillary Clinton and pointing out all of her scandals, but, but they, they weren't. didn't want to do that. Their leaders wanted right. them to target Donald Trump. Exactly. And that's where and it all started in Chicago. And that's one of the hotbeds. So you're going to see, I think Cleveland and Philly are going to be insane hotbeds for what's going to go on this summer. And, and for the rest, you know, the rest of the presidential race. You know, anytime Trump makes a speech, there's going to be um, riots or, or attacks on people. We saw it all through California. California is just turning into a total hotbed. And that's why you saw this at Sacramento, which incidentally, the last Trump rally, there wasn't much going on. So there was something there stirring the people to conflict at this particular event. So right. it's, it's really interesting how it just happened to happen magically overnight. They were even attacking camera people. Right. Sacramento Bee had their cameraman and reporter attacked by this group, by the BAM activists. Right. Well, and also, too, talking about just kind of controlling the agitation here, they knew that at the Trump rally, it's they're not going to run into your actual white supremacists who are going to show up there with, with knives, right. ready to stab and cut people. But at this particular event, they clearly... That's, they ran into people who were ready for a fight. That's the kind of agitation and noise that they were going to get. Yeah. And, they, and that's their whole purpose, is they try to make as much melee as possible in order to bring others into their group. Join us, and right. you too can be a it's little fun. We're gonna have a great time. militant. Look, I got to be on the news with a bloody bandage. This is what it's all about. This is what being American is all about, is causing strife, and not looking at the world the way it really is, but looking at the world the way we think it should be, and trying to steer it towards that. Incidentally, you can look at Matthew Heinbeck's Twitter, and uh, he's got a picture of all, of all the guys with shields ready to go into battle. So they were ready for a fight. The other group was ready for a fight. I don't know who steered who, but you could tell that there's going to be more clashes like this as we go into this. Finally, right. we're entering the summer of rage. Yeah, the as summer predicted of rage by Shooter is Jennings. upon us. Well, stick around because there's more nightly news coming right up. Welcome back. Joining me now is Joe Biggs. We're going to talk about the boots on the ground in terms of the chaos that's coming. As we were just talking about the financial chaos, understand immediately as Brexit was passed, we see stock markets, commodity markets uh, dropped and manipulated. And these are the same people now we see today, Standard & Poor's dropped the rating of Great Britain uh, by two <laughs> levels, just, just like that. And it took forever to try to get them to do anything about the uh, derivatives market that, was, uh, that created all the uh, mortgage chaos. So we, we've got chaos is being created in the financial markets. And we know that our government is now preparing and taking steps to militarily respond to any chaos that may be coming here in terms of food shortages or in terms of uh, economic chaos that they engineer. So, Joe, today we found out a couple of things. We're going to talk about uh, the U.N. military vehicles, a lot of reports of that in Virginia. But let's start first with this report from Cheryl Atkinson about U.S. soldiers, active duty soldiers, being involved in the smuggling of illegal aliens. Yeah, so there's an article out that says uh, U.S. authorities are investigating an illegal immigrant smuggling operation run by active duty soldiers out of Fort Bliss. Uh, Fort Bliss is where I was stationed last before I got out of the military. That's in El Paso, Texas. And they're saying they caught these two soldiers actually passing through the Fal Furious border checkpoint. It's like 125 miles away from McAllen Inland. Uh, Adon Salazar, Kit Daniels, John Bown and I have all gone through this checkpoint multiple times. Jakari Jackson, they're down at the border right now looking at uh, the open border and how Obama's allowing these people to come in. And what's going to happen? You're going to get people... He's not that, just allowing them. He's begging yeah. them to come in. And even when the Supreme Court said, no, you don't have the authority for these programs that you want to do and, and you can't stop the deportation of these people, he goes, well, I'm not going to pay attention to the Supreme Court. You get a lot of soldiers that join the military and they they come in, they, do, they, they work hard for a while, and they try to act like good, upstanding soldiers. But a lot of them come from really bad backgrounds. A lot of them do come over from cartel areas. A lot of them have family that are in gangs. And a lot of them come in and they, they play that upstanding soldier part for a few years. And then once they get in there and they get enough rank, they understand the system, how it works, and they're going to manipulate it. We've seen that with weapons. We've seen that with drugs. We've seen it all kinds of stuff. And now we have these guys who are actually bringing in 
uh, Mexican citizens and smuggling them into the country. Of course and, they're going to do people. They, they run drugs back and forth. And of course it was our government uh, under George Bush as well as Obama that was doing the gun walking, the fast and furious, to try to create a false flag to come after the Second Amendment. But they do drugs and they've been doing drugs back and forth uh, across the border because it's corruption. And it isn't even uh, guys who, as you point out, are, are coming in because uh, they, they want to go into the military and want to do the right thing. I mean, we've got people who are Ivy Leaguers who come in and run these banks, and they give El Chapo his own personal money laundering window at HSBC. I mean, that's simply a fact. And then they know that they're not going to get any trouble. These soldiers are going to get in a lot more trouble than any of the HSBC operatives who are working with the drug cartels and the terrorists, aren't they? Yeah, it's going to be interesting <laughs> to see how this all pans out. But uh, Atkinson actually said Friday, she says she found out that the U.S. government uh, Border Patrol stopped a couple of the guys trying to smuggle in the Mexican citizens about a week ago. Upon their arrest, one of them spoke of uh, other soldiers that are involved in a smuggling ring, a leader there at Fort Bliss that he said is paying them up to $1,500 a person. She also pointed out that Homeland Security has taken over the case, but no, does not seem to be talking about it at all. Interestingly, I don't know why, but Homeland Security took the case, didn't announce it, pretty big case, hasn't answered any questions of hers, and she thinks it's kind of baffling, she added. Uh, this is a good case in terms that they are stop something that may have been going on inside the military. Why aren't they answering any questions? So you have Homeland Security. They've come in, they've taken it over, and now it's kind of been hidden, thrown under the rug. And well, we know why it is. Over. We, it's, it's Obama's policy and it's Homeland Security's policy. And they have done everything they can to subvert the immigration laws. They have told honest agents, and we've had uh, the vice president on multiple times of the uh, Border Patrol Union, and he says how demoralizing it is for the honest agents who want to do their job and they're not allowed to enforce the borders because Obama and the Justice Department and Homeland Security have told them to stand down. They are paying to fly people into this country. And regardless of what happens with other branches of government, the executive branch is going to do what it wishes. They're not going to listen to anybody else. They're going to bring in a massive invasion of illegal aliens, because that's what this is. When you bring in They're a bringing sufficient in number, yeah, when you bring in a sufficient number of people that can't be assimilated, in other words, you can't find jobs for them. Uh, they're going to self ghettoize in their own cultural, religious groups, and so it, it truly is an invasion. Especially if you look at the demographics of who's coming in, it's mostly young men of military age. It's not typically families that are coming in. And this isn't the first time I've heard rumors of this stuff when I was in as well. You know, back in May, uh, two soldiers were sentenced at Fort Hood for human smuggling. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of stuff that's been going on for a while. Like you said, Obama's wanting it to happen. He wants those voters to come in. They want to allow Trump to come in, completely let them take a sinking ship. You know, Obama, Hillary, they've already set the charges. That's right. Trump's going to come in. They're going to blame it all on the conservative movement. They're going to blame it on the Republicans. And then what's going to happen? You brought in all these different illegals who are gonna, automatically going to vote for the Democrats, and then they're gonna come back in like some, you know, white knight, and then essentially take over, take our guns, and completely enslave us. And then we're told that this is a humanitarian issue, that we need to bring these people in because they're suffering immigrants. And yet, who created the problem there? We have yet another report, this one from the New York Times and Al Jazeera that came out, talking about how the CIA weapons for Syrian rebels are being funneled into a black market. Who knew, Joe? I mean, what have we been saying for three years here? And this is the way they put, this is the opening sentence of the report here that you see from the Hill. Weapons shipped to the Middle East by the CIA to arm Syrian rebels have systematically, systematically landed on the black market in Jordan. We know it's systematic. We know that this was a false flag plan. They want to create chaos in that area, just as we now see the globalists trying to create economic chaos in Great Britain. They created this, this uh, physical uh, chaos, this war in Syria, created the refugee problem, and then come back and say, well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a humanitarian issue, and we can't help them in country, so you have to bring them into your country. Well, there's a possible trip in the works that I'm working on that will actually be looking into that black market weapon cells over in the Middle East, so, you know, keep an eye out for that. Hopefully that all goes through and that happens, and I'm able to get out there and get that information, but it should be pretty interesting. Okay, now let's talk about the U.N. military vehicles that are seen in Virginia. And, of course, you and I went to A.P. Hill, mm -hmm. where they have a, uh, a, a place there where they are training uh, to take over uh, domestic uh, uh, cities. They have models of American cities. They have models of rural and suburban areas. You train where you fight, don't you, Joe? Yep. And that's what we hear from these people when they say, why are you doing these massive drills 
in uh, uh, Los Angeles. Why, why are you doing it? And the guy says, well, you train where you fight. If you're going to fight in the desert, you train in the desert. If you're going to fight uh, at, you know, in the ocean, you train there. But if you're going to fight in urban Western American cities, <laughs> that's, uh, that's where they train. I mean, that, that's, it's a complete and total map. It looks like D.C. It looks like your backyard. I mean, there were fire stations, banks, apartment complexes, a mosque, yeah. a church, a soccer field. This stuff is happening. And now you're seeing these U.N. vehicles being brought in. They're in these convoys. And everyone's kind of flipping out because you watch this stuff progress. And now all of a sudden you start hearing rumors about how the U.N. is going to come in and bring soldiers. You saw the movie Amerigeddon how that takes place. A lot of people are kind of upset and a lot of people are scared and they're wondering what's going on. I don't blame them. Well, you not only see the training that's going on in AP Hill and elsewhere, but of course there's also the article that came out today from Motherboard talking about the simulation of crises and engineered food shortages. And one of the interesting things that they said that would create the food shortage in their simulations was migration. And the name of the simulation was food chain reaction. Food <laughs> chain chain reaction, okay? They understand what they're doing. They are wargaming for this. They are physically out training with this. Now they're going down the roads with UN vehicles. They're not just hiding it in a military base inside of another military base as they did at AP Hill. This is coming out on the streets now. It's just absolutely amazing to see this unfold and to metastasize. Yeah, it's interesting, but there's another story I wanna talk about really quick that I just think is in itself kind of funny. The title says, Al-Qaeda urges lone wolves to target whites to avoid hate crime label. <laughs> so you're going to single out white people to avoid being racist. I mean, that in itself is hilarious. Maybe that's a proof, finally, that uh, if anybody needed it, that this is all being run out of the White House. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, we have a politically correct Taliban now. Al-Qaeda is going to be PC now because if they kill a whole bunch of black people, you know, then people might stand up against ISIS and then they might do something. But if they kill some white people, eh, who cares? Okay, stay with us when we come back. Rob Dew and Leanne McAdoo are going to analyze what happened this last week in California, this last weekend, where you had a knife attack uh, between different groups of protesters, probably both run by the U.S. government. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You should find it very interesting that we now see member after member of the GOP establishment lining up and actively supporting Hillary Clinton. Not just saying they can't vote for Trump, but actively supporting Hillary Clinton, especially people who were part of the cabinet of George W. Bush. Here's an example. Hank Meltdown Paulson, as Breitbart calls him, cites Hillary's globalist platform as a reason to endorse her. Now, this was George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary. He presided over the meltdown of the economy. And as we pointed out earlier, when we talked about how Standard & Poor's has moved immediately to downgrade Great Britain to put pressure on them, took them down two notches. And of course, they, it took them forever. They never did it, okay, when you had the, uh, uh, the, the bailout, the meltdown of the economy over mortgages. But now we see the guy who presided over that, the guy who presided over the bailout, now he is endorsing Hillary Clinton. He is also, interestingly enough, a former CEO of Goldman Sachs. That tells you everything you should know by that. The connections of the Bush and Clinton establishment, they are one and the same. It is a single party. And listen to one of the key things that he likes about Hillary Clinton that he talks about. Paulson posits that Clinton would be more likely to cut Americans' Medicare and Social Security than Donald Trump would. He cites that as a top priority. So there you go. Vote for Hillary Clinton, Democrats, and get your Medicare and your Social Security cut. And you can also turn over your democracy to the globalist, to the corporate elitists, okay? We can see now the GOP truly does stand for the globalist oligarch party. But so do the Democrats. But here's another person from the uh, George W. Bush administration. We've got Nicholas Burns, former senior State Department official with the W. administration. And he quoted as this Brexit uh, situation was developing, and they're talking about the U.S. and the U.K.'s special relationship being fundamentally altered. He quotes Henry Kissinger, and he says his famous question, who do I call in Europe? He goes, well, I think now that's going to be Germany. He says, we're now going to work to strengthen our relationship with Germany. And this is now a Democrat congressman, Brendan Boyle from Pennsylvania. See, it's a single party. They're going to work together to try to get this transatlantic partnership trade deal together, even though 
the European Union is unraveling from the bottom. They're going to try to stop that through a fear campaign. Another Democrat says uh, Germany will become even more dominant in the EU, said Ben Cardin, the most senior Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So now they're openly bragging about the control that Germany has over the EU. And of course, that has been the case from the very beginning. When we looked at the responses to what had happened to Brexit last Friday, it was a very harsh and cold response from Germany, whereas other states, heads like Italy, uh, Greece and others would say, well, let, let's see if we can't work something out, uh, do, do something with this. And even German businessmen were saying it would be foolish to try to punish Great Britain. And yet that's what we see coming from the United States, coming from Germany. We also, we had Obama go over there and tell them essentially, uh, you guys are going to be in the back of the bus. And uh, they didn't really care what Obama said. He's not going to be the one writing the uh, trade agreements. But here's another one, Alan Greenspan. Oh, there's a big difference between Republicans and Democrats, isn't there? Remember, Alan Greenspan was the head of the private Federal Reserve from Reagan to George H.W. Bush through the Clinton years and even into W's, most of W's uh, regime all the way up to 2006. He was the chair of the private Fed. Here's what he had to say about Brexit. He said uh, the U.K.'s government miscalculated in agreeing to schedule this referendum in the first place, he said. He said they underestimated the desperation among the electorate. But he said this desperation is hardly unique to the United Kingdom. He said it would be foolish to overlook it in places like the United States, even if no one wishes to politically discuss this, because it's politically very difficult to discuss. He said what we see is a desperate population out there. We're seeing it everywhere. We see it in the United States. You can see it all during our election period. It's a fear. It's a desperation. And here's the issue, folks. Can they take Project Fear? Can they make you fear independence and self-government more than you fear the serfdom of turning over your country to unelected bureaucrats and technocrats that will rule you? Again, we see George Will coming out and saying, uh, well, I, I can't do it. I'm leaving the Republican Party. He said, we're just going to have to make sure that Trump loses and Hillary wins. We need to grit our teeth for four years while Hillary, is, while Hillary is there and then hope we can win the White House, okay? What caused George Will to go out? Was it Obamacare? No, no, he didn't have a problem with that. Was it the open borders? No, no, he didn't have a problem with that or with Paul Ryan. Gun control? No. Uh, surveillance state? No. The unconstitutional war on drugs? None of that bothered George Will. No, what bothered him was the fact that Donald Trump, he said, called a judge who is part of La Raza, who is openly biased against Donald Trump, and called him out for that. Uh, that. That was a thing that triggered George Will, according to George Will. Now look what else is going to be happening, because we understand that if Donald Trump gets elected, his biggest opponent is going to be Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House. He's going to be the one who is going to try to keep the borders open. That has been the central issue of Paul Ryan his entire career. But also now Marco Rubio has come back in and re-entered the Senate race, which he said he wasn't going to run in. But he says, uh, if elected, that's going to be what he is going to be most focused on. If re-elected to the Florida Senate, he says, uh, he will make the two most controversial pieces of Donald Trump's agenda, his immigration policy and his proposal to ban Muslims from traveling to the United States, his central uh, issues that he will oppose. Now, of course, it is not a comprehensive ban. What Donald Trump said is, we need to understand who these people are. We need to vet them. And of course, we hear that in the gun control cries. We need to have background checks. Oh, but not on people who could be terrorists coming in. Only on you who grew up in this country. You're the ones who need the background checks, not the people that we're bringing in in massive numbers. But it turns out that Marco Rubio has an opponent. Once he came back into the race, the people who were in the primaries all bowed out except for one person. And this one person looks remarkably like Donald Trump. This is a millionaire, Carlos Baruf. He has endorsed Trump for president. He's espoused some of the same controversial beliefs, according to The Hill. And they both have an ally, common ally, in Florida Governor Rick Scott. And this is what he said in a statement on Friday, the guy who's running against Marco Rubio, Baruf. He says, the voters of Florida can reelect Washington's candidate, who has consistently failed to do the job they hired him to do and won't commit to serving a full six-year term, or they can make a change. Do you want a senator who puts politics and their own ambition first? Or do you want a senator who puts Florida first? He is, uh, they say he's a 58-year-old real estate developer. And he says, 
this. He says, the experts want me to read a bunch of political crap off of this teleprompter. Here's what I have to say. Obama is a disaster and Washington politicians are worthless. How about we try to take our country back and put America first? And that's precisely what we need. We need somebody like that. We don't need someone like Marco Rubio, who betrayed conservative voters who put him in, who became part of the Gang of Eight, and now, even though he denied it throughout the presidential race, says that his first priority is going to be to block Donald Trump on immigration, along with Speaker Paul Ryan, if he is reelected. Now, just to understand how precarious our freedoms are, take a look at this article about the control of our transportation. We talk about this frequently, about how autonomous cars and the efforts of Google and Uber are really to take control of our transportation system. Now they are openly admitting it. We see here on Via Drudge Report, secretive alphabet division, and of course that's one of the Google subdivisions, aims to fix public transportation in the U.S. by shifting control to Google. Now, I would put fix in quotation marks. They're not going to repair our public transportation system. It's not really all that broken, folks, okay? What they're going to do is fix it as in a corrupt, crony, capitalist approach. This is a company called Sidewalk Labs. It's a subsidiary of Alphabet, which is formerly Google. They want to radically overhaul public parking and transportation in American cities. Emails and documents obtained by The Guardian reveal. They say they want new superpowers to extend access and mobility, except what we're really looking at here is crony capitalism on steroids. It is true economic fascism. They will take a cut of everything that comes in. They are going to offer free services, free services for a while to uh, Columbus, Ohio, which just won the $50 million Smart City Challenge. But understand, they want to take control over all transportation. They will take a cut of everything that you buy, and you will be renting all of your transportation, and it will be subject to the police states using it as a privilege. Well, that's it for tonight's news. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.